So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin John. I'm uh, the Managing Director of the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. Um, I'm so excited to have this conversation with these three brilliant scholar activists slash many other roles. Um, so let's uh, jump right in. I'll um, introduce you all one by one um, and then give you about five or so minutes to talk about your work, your research, um, uh, activist work, and then how your work engages with politics of race, uh, trans identity, and abolition. So we'll do um, alphabetical order just to not uh, make it feel like there's any kind of hierarchy except for the whole hierarchy. <laughs> um, and also, so captions, a lot of captions are on. So if you need captions, um, you should have the option to uh, see the captions and to open um, the full uh, transcript on the side. All right, so let's start with Key Alexander. So Dr. Key Alexander um, is a queer, trans, Black, Puerto Rican scholar, educator, and organizer. They're an assistant professor of gender, sexuality, and trans studies in curriculum and pedagogy at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. Um, their current research explores pedagogies of abolitionist practice in the lives, or in the lived experience, excuse me, of Black trans folks. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying, please excuse me, because I'm a little under the weather. So I'm a little slow, brain foggy, and a little nasally, but I'm really, really grateful to be here with you all today. Um, again, my name is Key, my pronouns are they, them, um, and I'm a, an assistant professor of gender, sexuality, and trans studies in curriculum and pedagogy. So mostly um, my work is thinking about the intersection of education and queer and trans studies, um, particularly thinking about political education um, in movements, um, thinking about uh, lived experience as uh, like a pedagogical project that can we learn more about. So right now my research is about abolitionist praxis, um, particularly how people are teaching and learning abolitionist praxis in movement. And I kind of zone in a little bit uh, zoom in a little bit more to think about how Black trans life can inherently be pedagogical in a way to resist and refuse the carceral state. Um, and so right now I'm really thinking about um, how we get, how we really challenge the notion of study, um, as particularly as an education scholar who is kind of a school abolitionist, you know, I'll put it out there, you know, one day, like if, if our work goes right, we won't have jobs, um, which, you know, hopefully that's the goal. <laughs> um, so it's been an interesting position for me to really think about how do I get my students to reconsider what study could be, um, particularly outside of formal classrooms. So in movement, how do we um, figure out how to learn? And after being on the ground organizing, particularly around the uprisings, I lived in Minneapolis during the uprisings um, while I was finishing my dissertation. Um, it really just got me curious about how how are we learning about these things? How are, you know, we have these Instagram and like social media um, ways of teaching. Um, so I, I started to really get curious about like, but how are people learning, especially if they, particularly Black trans people, often have really hard experiences in schools because they're fundamentally anti-Black, fundamentally cis-sexist. Um, and so that's where my inquiry is happening right now. Great, thank you. Also, um, forgot to mention, um, if uh, audience members have questions, there's a Q&A box. Um, so uh, if you can put questions in there, it'll be a little bit easier just for me to keep track of them. Um, great, so next we have a Blue Alexander, or sorry, getting people's names mixed up already, um, Blue Buchanan. <laughs> So Dr. Blue Buchanan is a postdoctoral university fellow in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at the University of North Carolina Asheville. 
Their research focuses broadly on the role of uh, violence in everyday life, which informs their twin research trajectories, studying whiteness and masculinity as projects shaping intracommunal violence in the LGBT community and the practices and habits Black trans folks develop to resist and decenter violence in their everyday lives. Hi, folks. Um, welcome. So yeah, uh, just to add a little bit more to that, um, I'm a sociologist by training. My focus is on historical and interview methods. Um, and I come to the question of abolition from uh, both a trans and a race and a labor perspective in particular, right? Um, uh, just a shout out to uh, UAW 2865, which is on strike right now. Um, that was my home where I really started thinking about both trans organizing and trans study and um, abolition work more broadly. So really imagining what the role of labor is in making our workplaces safe um, and talking about like anti-police as um, as a movement for safety in the workplace. So um, in terms of my work, I study gay men's participation in right-wing social movements. I uh, just finished up the dissertation uh, in September, and I look at everything from your run-of-the-mill log cabin Republicans over to your gay neo-Nazis. Um, this informs my work around both trans studies um, and, and trans abolition efforts um, because it's like understanding the enemy, right? You got to know how systems of violence operate um, and particularly how systems of tokenism work, right? This is also absolutely important for us to, to understand as organizers. And I'm actually interested in how some of our overlap is, is going to go because talking about things like Black study have also been important to me, right? Um, thinking about study outside of the university, thinking about the undercommons in particular, um, thinking about funneling the resources we have um, as scholars into our local communities is really exciting. And I'm so, so uh, looking forward to having this conversation with this group of scholars. Great, thank you. And so um, the last person to introduce to everyone today is uh, Dr. S.A. Smythe, um, who is a poet, transdisciplinary artist, translator, and critical theorist. They're currently assistant professor of Black Studies and the Archive in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. Uh, their work focuses on the liberatory aspects of Black belonging beyond borders, specifically with re regards to trans embodiment in poetics, citizenship and migration, colonial history, and the literary imagination. Thank you, Eri. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think I was unmuted <laughs> for this whole time, so sorry if that did something to your screens. I'm in the Faculty of Information, but I'm from the past. So, um, yeah, I am really excited to be here. I'm also, like Blue, really excited to see where this conversation is going to go with the different um, uh, overlaps. Um, this is definitely no shade to the organizers. Shout out to Ari, TJ, and everyone at CATS. But I also um, blew your question. I'm already not doing the introduction, but um, when Blue mentioned that, um, you know, the, the relevance of Black studies, which is where I locate myself. Um, I was also thinking and wondering if we could talk about uh, trans activism, trans of color activism and Black trans activism and the distinctions between the two, as well as the convergences. Um, so I'm just putting that on the table. But um, yeah, like Eri said, um, I'm working in Black studies and the archive at U of T. Um, I came to, uh, abolition from the point of view of migration, not so much migration studies, but my actual embodied experience. And um, when I was um, at university in Italy, working and coming into fellowship with um, East African people in Italy um, and African migrants um, in the Southern Mediterranean. Um, and that's where my primary uh, research is focused. Um, but I say not migration studies, and I know we're already kind of talking about disciplinary 
methods and investments and the abolition of, 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 of studies um, in a university sense, um, but actually it comes from thinking with migrants and coming to understand how they, we get coordinated and organized in relation to discipline, not just in the academic context, but in relation to the state. Um, I also um, came to sort of make those connections through, like Blue, my presence in the University of California system, where I went to graduate school in history of consciousness um, uh, and um, was a professor before U of T um, at UCLA and basically you know, hold my way through five of the 10 UC campuses. So total solidarity to the UC workers. That is definitely where I came to understand. California is where I came to understand the US struggles for abolition. And with my own previous background and those of my community in um, organizing spaces in the UK and Italy came to see anti-colonial, decolonial struggles as um, in directly within the genealogy of abolition. And so that um, is, yeah, what I'm especially wanting to talk about later on. Thanks. Great, thank you. Sorry, I was like taking notes already just in those introductions. I'm already seeing so many different directions and questions and connections. Um, yes, shout out to uh, University of California. I'm um, currently, uh, I'm at Northwestern and we are um, on our way, hopefully, to unionizing the graduate workers there. Um, so labor is definitely, I think, a big kind of um, topic here. Um, but let's start kind of our kind of baseline of um, how you all see um, racial justice, trans activism, and abolition as connected. And I think um, that you are um, point about trans activism, trans of color activism, and black trans activism as each being kind of distinct uh, movements, I think will play into this question. Um, but let's start with that kind of basic, like what are the connections between uh, uh, these different movements um, and what are the intersections there? And also we can bring up like, what are the differences? What are the, um, uh, divisions between all of these, um, all of these movements. Now the real question is who's going to go first? I can jump in. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about how um, I actually was just at NWSA um, and saw a lot of beautiful faces um, and um, shout out to the For the Girls panel. Um, and it was interesting. I went to a panel that was about reproductive justice and trans rights. And there was this conversation about human rights and if, and if we should be kind of like chasing the human rights framework to think about how we're thinking about trans people and reproductive rights. Um, and there was somebody in the audience who had said, I, I don't think we should throw away the human rights thing. I think it, it's been useful, right? Um, and I really like how the panel responded, which was this kind of idea of like, well, what do rights do? Like what, what do our rights actually do? And if we're saying that we wanna rely on a human rights or a civil rights model, what are the ways that those rights frameworks fall short for our communities anyways, right? And so people are not getting what they need out of healthcare generally in the US, right? And so to say, oh, well, we're kind of, we'll put it in the civil rights bag around healthcare, we're not actually meeting the needs of our communities. So I, I think that, um, and to Essay's point about the like the differences between like black trans activism and other types of trans activism, I do think that there's a skew around representation versus survival. Um, and I think that black trans folks are trying to think about how to stay alive in these really real ways um, versus just how to be represented by the state. Um, and I and I think also too, there's this connection with um when civil rights doesn't uh, protect you, what it, the opposite happens where it seeks to criminalize you, right? And so these civil rights frameworks are actually 
ways of negotiating who are we allowed to criminalize and who are we not allowed to criminalize, right? Um, and I just see these ways in which in the US we create these pockets of kind of like twisting and manipulating rights frameworks to figure out, you know, who, who we need another set of people to criminalize and send to, for their labor, for their exploited labor to prison, right? So I think about something as an educator thinking about, you know, the defunding of public education, right? Like Republicans want to pull the plug on education. And for me, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, well, school's compulsory and you're required to go to school. But if we get rid of public schooling, basically we will then be allowed to criminalize a whole fraction of people who can't afford to go to school, right? Um, and so I think there are all these ways in which criminalization um, is something that we have to hold in the center, much like Blue said, also thinking about labor and the relationship between criminalization and labor, I think um, is important, is like an important intersection to tease through. Did, should I go? Okay. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, uh, just to to pull out some of the threads that I, I think I'm hearing, right, um, is around anti-statism and, and anti-statism, particularly from the perspective of like Black trans abolition work. Um, and here, I actually, I want to maybe reframe or not just to talk about survival, but to talk about like Black thriving and Black trans thriving in particular. Um, that like Black trans folks getting their needs met through and with each other in the face of obstacles, I think is a really important way of thinking about this. Often when Black trans folks are positioned as like objects of death that then like trans activism more broadly utilizes to be like, look, this is why you need to give us rights. Um, and so, yeah, I think drawing out a tradition, particularly within black trans abolition work that is anti-statist in its origins, not just sort of dealing with human rights, but asking, is it possible to get our needs met outside of the state? Um, and particularly for the Black trans folks in the United States, talking about within a settler colonial anti-Black apparatus, right? Um, and so when I think about sort of civil rights, trans activism, abolition, um, to me, what that abolition is calling for is meeting each other's needs um, at a community level. And that's one of the reasons why I think this panel is so exciting is because um, it's opening up the conversation, hopefully, to talk about what we can do outside of just being represented within the academy. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, really want to sort of talk about anti-statism around abolition. Um, and how we can imagine meeting each other's needs outside of representation and tokenism more broadly. Mm, mm, mm. Representation is a Babylon thing, so are rights. Listen, what Key was talking about, I'm just pivoting the energy a little, I hope that's okay. Um, Eri said that this was a conversation, and so that's what I'm excited about. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish I was at that panel key because that sounds um, like a dope and generous response um, coming from, I'm going to say this all the time, like each turn, but like the transnational perspective um, is really important to me. It's like shaped my um, being um, politically um, and certainly otherwise. And I, um, you know, sometimes we, we have conversations and I think it's re really important, which is why I'm like, uh, not trying to start shit, but like, let's name the distinction so that we know what it is that we're talking about when we are convening um, at a given moment, because we say something like rights. And yeah, in the US, it means something. But if you're then thinking or in the US for US citizens, it means something. And those rendered non-citizen or non-citizens precisely, it means something else. Thinking about human rights in um, the, the space that I um, study, that I organize in as well, like the Mediterranean, Mediterranean, um, thinking about human rights 
uh, takes on a, a very sinister valence that like migrants and people that are rendered refugees, asylum seekers, Roma people, et cetera, um, are fundamentally an anti-statist because the state is anti them and has been founded precisely to, to be that and to do that. And then it makes us, those of us who are citizens, um, complicit in the project of the state. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm totally with with both of you, um, and I also think that uh, the the fundamental um, awareness uh, and need for human rights does not need to then be thrown out, right? Like Stuart Hall told us decades ago about both ends, and I think you know it is fair to both struggle for the dis with within the the terrain, the discourses that we have, human rights, civil rights, etc., and also to acknowledge that if we're talking about something like civil rights, uh, some of us were always rendered uncivil. If we're talking about human rights, some of us have been fundamentally rendered un and inhuman. In fact, in order for human to exist exist, some of us, the Black of us, have needed to um, constantly be the bedrock of modernity, right? That's what anti-Blackness um, uh, teaches us and disciplines us into always. And so I think that um, moving towards something like Black trans thrival is something that I've written about, something that I think about all the time. I'm really happy to hear it. Um, I really also, I, I, I would love to talk maybe more about how, um, how to get folks on board, um, because this then seems also to me like a, a, an issue of education <laughs> and anti-indoctrination, because um, like with the theme of abolition or the topic of abolition, there are folks who are like, well, then what's the blueprint? Like, what's the plan? As though um, literally struggling and resisting and like forming community bonds and doing the local work that we need to survive on the way to thrival um, is 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 not being is not taking place. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm just I just want to riff off that for a moment, um, right? But but this is absolutely um, and I'm sure all of us doing abolition work have heard the like, well, if you get rid of this thing, what are you gonna do, right? Um, and when will we get to talking about the undercommons and things like that? Folks are like, the absence or the tearing down of something creates opportunities for new things, new imaginings that would not have been possible under previous regimes or institutions, right? And so I do, I just want to sort of name that, particularly for those folks who are listening, who are maybe starting to have conversations about abolition, you will get a lot of pushback being like, well, if you get rid of this, what you know, what are you going to replace it with? Um, and I really want to sort of acknowledge that essay, like what you're, what you're naming is also that that is a process or a practice, not just an end goal, right? Or a blueprint that we have to like sign off on or approve before undertaking it. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, this question of like misinformation and education, right? Like, I think that oftentimes part of what I think is so powerful of Black trans life and Black trans ways of thinking is to kind of um, just to poke holes in where we see binaries show up. Because I think this conversation about abolition is often put in a binary, right? And I think we're asking the wrong questions. The question is like, should we have police? Yes or no? And that's like not the right question. The right question is what do we do to keep our community safe, right? Those are different things. Um, and so I think part of one of the powerful things of like black trans folks leaving, leading abolitionist movements is to kind of like poke holes in the ways in which we're reproducing, like, like as I said, right? Like we can become complicit in these things because we've gotten some rights or we've gotten access to things that other people don't do. And I think, you know, and especially as someone who was like born and raised in the US and has spent my entire life, except for now, now I live in Canada. Um, it is this, I, I am continually being humbled by the ways in which US propaganda has really shaped the ways in which I'm even allowed to think about my own identity and my own communities. And it has actually been, 
being in community with international scholars like SA, like being able to be in Canada and meet people from all over the world, I am, like I said, humbled by the fact that, yeah, this like um, part of being an American is part of being complicit in these systems. And, and like Blue said, this anti-statism is a place where we can be a place of solidarity with folks who are outside of our current, you know, country context, right? Um, and I think that, yeah, we'll stop there. I just wanted to add again, I, I promise we'll get to the next question. Um, it's just like, for example, I, I want to recognize that one of the things we talked about was like settler colonialism and colonialism more broadly. Like, again, one of the ways that we can help to sort of bridge the conversation about transnational abolition, about these processes, is recognizing the labor conditions that pr like help to produce them. And specifically about how things like settler colonialism, these processes are, are transnational. Like the British weren't just like, oh, we're going to stop right here in this little bubble, right? That's going to be our little, our area that we're influencing. And so the connections are already there. And in fact, they, if we really sort of look at colonialism, I think more carefully, something that many scholars in the US don't do. Um, we end up having a really rich area for, for co-organizing. Yeah, um, yeah, so totally want to keep this conversation. So feel free to continue ripping off of each other as much as you want. Um, I want to top in and say something about um, the transnational thinking about um, these connections. One of the, I was on um, not the uh, reproductive rights and trans um, uh, trans healthcare panel, but I was on the, the for the girls or for the dolls um, round table, which was about sort of um, trans femme of uh, color um, experiences. And one of one of my panelists brought up um, the um, the murder of Jennifer Lottie in um, the Philippines, who was, um, if I'm remembering correctly, who was a sex worker who was um, uh, who had a John who was an American um, Navy officer or some military something or other. Um, I really should have like looked this up before coming here, but um, and like thinking that really got me thinking about how like the US and the US, US military com industrial complex, the US police state, the US security state, like has these like effects all over the globe. Of course, the Philippines as a former colony of the US. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't really have a question from that, but that was just like something that got me like thinking, like even if we like are coming, even if we're like thinking just about the US context, which we're not today, but if that was the case, like it's impossible to think about abolition just in the US, like abolition in the US also has ripples in the rest of the world in abolition um, elsewhere. Yeah. I don't know. Does anyone want to continue on that topic? Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, so one of the things that I study is the 1033 program, um, which for folks who don't know what that is, um, it's basically a U.S. program that funnels military surplus to local police departments across the United States for only the cost of shipping. Um, so this is how we end up with like mine resistant ambush protected vehicles um, in West Lafayette, Indiana, which for those who are not Hoosiers, um, there is no no reason. Like this is a little college town, right? Um, the 1033 program combines with other things that are going on that I think, again, um, to Ari, to your 
conversation about the, the U.S. military industrial complex. So the 1033 program, in order to get some of these uh, weaponry, right, to get these mine resistant vehicles, they have to show that they, they know how to use them. And so there are conferences set up um, around the U.S. and I'm sure elsewhere as well that basically are where military experts come to teach local department police department members how to use the weapons uh, and the tactics and strategies the military uses to transfer those skills to local police departments in the United States right so I, I just I I want to note that the kind of strategies and tactics, the imperialism abroad is deeply connected to the imperialism within the settler colonial state that is the, the US. Um, and so the very experiences um, that people are having of being like shot and tear ga like tear gassed, et cetera, these are this like this is the same tear gas that we're finding in Palestine. Right. These are the same weapons, the same tools that are being used elsewhere. Um, and so I think that if we're it's important to sort of trace those material things as well. And I wanted to note that with Jennifer Laud, um, the other thing was that the U.S. military, he was either Navy or Marines, um, that they specifically like brought him back onto the boat in order to exert U.S. jurisdiction um, so that he would not be prosecuted in the Philippines, right? So there's also this, this moving jurisdiction, this moving settler colonial apparatus, right, um, that allows trans antagonism and particularly trans antagonism against folks of color to continue. Essay, did you want to, I saw that you had your mic off earlier. I didn't know if you wanted to respond. I'm just constantly touching that thing, but I'm, I'm happy to wait <laughs> for the next question. Okay, so, I mean, again, this is a conversation that should should not stop here, but I do want to ask um, one of the reasons I was so excited about bringing this group of scholars together was um, to think about engaging with communities outside of the academy. And that's um, something that we've already uh, touched on. Um, and I think personally, as someone who is, you know, a grad student is kind of in a precarious position in the academy, we're always, I feel like we're always kind of discouraged from doing too much activist work because it doesn't count for tenure or whatever. Um, which of course is part of the neoliberal structure of the academy is thinking like only certain products counts for productivity or count for whatever. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about um, how to kind of push back against that and use, um, use our roles as academics to, to build more community power I loved, um, I think it was, was it key, I forget, um, or blue, I forget who, um, talked about funneling uh, university resources into the community. I personally have, maybe I should not be admitting this on camera, but I personally have like tried to do that. Um, and that's one way that I love, um, one strategy that I love to like think about is like, what what can we do to use our positions um, to um, to uh, move these um, abolitionist um, justice um, and uh, liberatory movements forward? Um, I'm just going to jump in um, and say that the way to do it is to just do it because it is a scam. I understand that I'm not a graduate student and I know that there are graduate students on the call as well as on the panel, um, Eri, but uh, I'm not being um, facetious when I say this, right? Um, at UCLA, I was an assistant professor and if I did not um, quit or you know work in another place, um, I'd be going up for tenure now. Um, 
And as an assistant professor, they told me the exact same thing, right? Like, well, but it's not going to count. And uh, I, you know, you have to make uh, decisions. Um, I'm fully aware that this is being recorded, but <laughs> I don't even go here. So try something, right? Like it doesn't, it truly, it actually doesn't matter. I really want us to, um, those who can hear my voice or like catch this recording to, to really, um, Think about what it might mean for us to dig deep and have a real conversation about positionality. Um, I'm saying this coming from like a Black feminist um, epistemology and perspective, um, our standpoints, right, our moving points, because, uh, you know, some of us are more precarious than others, but it's uh, um, whatever is the reverse of a rat race to then say, well, I'm precarious and therefore, right? Like, Ari, you're a graduate student, you're at Northwestern though, right? That, like, uh, some of us are faculty, but there are more people uh, who are considered faculty, who are contingent, um, adjunct, <laughs> almost indentured, more than more than um, I would be as a tenure track assistant professor at UCLA, right? So it was really important for me to actually name this and know this for myself and recognize the position that I was cast in relation to, what it meant to be um, just by rote of a position, um, like hoisted into uh, the middle class, not just the middle class, but the US middle class. I mean, I, I got a therapist, so it was like sort but you know it meant a lot for me coming from rural Caribbean Central American upbringing to realize well I'm in this place and what does it mean what should I do but can I do that and that's what um, the lack of a class consciousness across Turtle Islands has done to us right uh, Blue already sort of opened the door by having us by naming labor Blue but um, I just as an extension of that I think the the related absence of a class and racial consciousness across Turtle Island um, is an issue, um, is an issue when faculty then get cast into the role of managers and graduate students are then our workers and we need to then hold the disciplinary line in the service of the institution and the administration. Um, and so we can also just decide to have that not be the case. Um, it is obviously, you know, like with any kind of movement towards solidarity, there are pain points, it's difficult and not again being facetious and like, just do it. But if you don't just do it, <laughs> like hashtag Nike, then what, what are we going to do? Just sort of navel gaze and, and have a conversation until the cows come home that does not work that is ineffective um and that is sort of a waste of um the awareness of our of our positions and so I just yeah I really wanted to um to, I don't know if that's like too much but I really I think it's something that is um absolutely um important because of course right Ari, of course what we are going to do is steal back the resources of the university I'm Keep talking about UCLA because I just moved from there and those are the numbers that I know, but I look forward to learning more about um, U of T's numbers so I can read them for filth. But UCLA at the time that George Floyd was murdered um, had, um, had recently ended a fundraiser where they made $5.5 billion. That's billion with a B, right? And that was also you know, in the wake of the COLA strike that led to the formation of what is now the Cops Off Campus movement that spread across Turtle Island where students specifically at my alma mater, UCLA, see Santa Cruz were asking for a cost of living adjustment of $1,412 a month, right? Instead, the University of California gave $375,000 to police externally to come and repress that labor struggle, which is also asking for the abolition of police on campuses. So these things are already um, taking place. People are already taking risks because for some of us, it is a risk to live. And so I think when we think about the bigger picture, um, we almost have like no choice, right? It's it, in this way, maybe I am being a non-binary person who is super down for binaries because you're either with it or you're not. There's, it doesn't really behoove us to then say, well, but as a single mom with this and this and this, yes, get somebody to help you watch those kids, get somebody to draw in community, solicit resources on a local level and make the pressure sort of more diffuse and distributed so that we can all be in a movement um, against the state, against various institutions together, rather than um, sort of use that fear for tenure, for X, Y, Z institutionalized thing to sort of um, like pin us down to a position that is actually undermining our communities in the long run. Yeah. Just a moment, appreciation. Um, so there have been some studies that look at um, faculty and sort of talking about like organizing work 
And basically what people have found is like, oh, first graduate students will say, well, I'm just gonna keep my head down because I need to become faculty. And then at faculty levels, and it's like, I'm gonna keep my head down until I get tenure. And then once it's like tenure, it's like, oh, I need to keep my head down so that, you know, I just get through whatever the next milestone is, right? Um, so this, I think the discussion around like, when is gonna be the time, I think essay has it right on point that like the time is now. Um, I also want to name sort of two other things that that have that come out of what at least what I'm hearing from essay, which is the first is that people are often stopped by shame. Um, people are like, oh no, I have this position of power. And again, like a black feminist epistemology is not gonna say, like, oh, get lost in feeling shame about that. It means you have resources, you have you have money, you have things. It's about how you use them in order to create a liberatory space, right? Um, and a lot of sociologists, a lot of Black feminists, uh, scholars more broadly, have argued that shame is not a helpful uh, sort of spiral to get into when we're talking about doing organizing work. Right. In fact, shame is often attached to positions of power where, um, you know, shame helps to keep things like whiteness and toxic masculinity sort of centered. Right. Because then you're still making it about yourself. Um, and that's that's not helpful. Right. So really, the question is, um, particularly from a black feminist perspective, is like, well, what is your point of leverage? What do you uniquely have that enables you to do the work that needs to be done? And the other part, and I think that this is tied to both abolition more, more broadly, to police abolition. Um, I, I worked with Disarm UC and other abolition groups um, leading up to COLA, um, working on getting uh, police and, and sort of uh, disarm and defund movements around George Floyd. Um, the issue was always one that was framed as scarcity, right? Um, they're like, there's never enough resources to go around. And so that sort of uh, scarcity, that austerity is what promotes the, well, now I've gotten mine and I need to keep it. I'm scared of losing it instead of making it available for more people, right? And so really part of what we're also combating is again, that labor perspective of like capitalism's call to austerity, that there's never gonna be enough for everyone and therefore we all have to duke it out for scraps, right? Instead of recognizing um, as S.A. pointed out, things like the beautiful abundance that can happen when we look at class consciousness and recognize where we are positioned. Um, and so I, I think, again, just something that this made me think of is participating in protests at UC Davis, uh, which is where I was. We shut down Milo Yiannopoulos uh, when he was first doing his sort of tours through UC campuses. And one of the internal organizing things that I found so fascinating was that it was black and brown folks who were um, putting themselves on the line to face down police and to basically shut it down. Um, and at first there were lots of white participants who were like, yes, I also will help. But they like were shedding <laughs> as we got closer to the organizing, right? And I noted this in our organizing space and people were like, that's not very intersectional of you. Like you're not taking into account that like we have other forms of oppression and like that we are also being held down. And I was like, one, intersectionality is always race, boo boo. Like you don't get to like take it, take race out. Um, but also this again, question of there's always going to be a reason to say, well, I'm in a precarious position, so I don't want to put myself on the line. 
right? Um, and the fact is, is that we don't, we don't have the luxury to opt out um, because no matter what we, we reap the benefits or we see the negative consequences of these systems as they come to pass, right? And so I, again, I, I just wanna note that this idea of sort of, you know, I'll do it when I'm not oppressed doesn't, that's, that's not the kind of organizing space. We don't need to wait until we're not oppressed to do the work of abolition, right? It's about creating the world that we want to see. So many things, so many great things. Okay, so the first thing I want to say was thinking about Blue mentioned the undercommons earlier. And I always like, I think it's like such an important text, particularly for educators to think about. And like the only like relationship to have with the university is a criminal one, right? It's like this idea of, I mean, for me as a new faculty member, like that has been my compass of kind of being like, I'm not trying to like magically transform the University of Toronto. It's not going to happen. You know, like what I'm trying to do is figure out how to take this research money <laughs> and basically give it to Black trans people um, and figure out ways in which I can create spaces through those resources to help people get their needs met and help people build relationships, right? Um, and so I think, and I think as an education scholar, I have seen a lot of my classmates really struggle with that text um, because the field of education largely tends to be white women, um, much like social work, much like these other kind of like feminized helping labor, right? And um, I've really seen people struggle with what does it mean to um, climb this ladder and not reap the benefits, like you're saying, right? Um, and like, I worked so hard, I did so many things and, 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 it, and it fell short. And there's like this embedded part of the academy that is just like this like failure right like there are so many brilliant amazing people who are trying to you know put work into the world and part of being an academic is just being told no all the time right and like figuring out how to keep going regardless um and I think you know this point that I really appreciated both of you mentioned was thinking about like what happens when we don't have an analysis of racial capitalism and something that I, um, which I saw like kind of echo during the uprisings was suddenly after George Floyd's murder, suddenly black organizing got this huge influx of money, like huge millions of dollars, right? To orgs all over the country who were trying to do abolitionist work. And it caused so many ruptures and fissures in those localized contexts. Um, part of it was because there is, that's the scarcity mentality, right? Of this like, um, hop off that money, you just need to give it to people, right? Um, and some of it was like, okay, but what are the resources we need to actually like create the campaigns that we need to like basically get rid of the police? So in Minneapolis, one of the things that was happening post uprising is that organizers were working to get a question on the ballot if the city of Minneapolis wanted to get rid of the Minneapolis Police Department and replace it with the Department of Public Safety that was going to think about mental health resources, you know, have different people um, kind of react to like non emergencies, like all these different kinds of things. And the elect, the a little brain fuzzy, so bear with me, but I think the electoral um, board around the election is not elected, they're appointed by the mayor. Right. And so basically the electoral board was like, you're not, we're not going to let you put this question on the ballot. We we're not even going to let people consider this. Right. And they got a lawyer. And so part of the organizing, they had to use those funds to figure out how to like, how do we fight this thing in court so we can get what we said that we would want the people to decide that whether what we're going to do with the police in the city. Right. And fighting for that takes resources. Right. Um, but when you had a bunch of people, right, it was the beginning of the pandemic, people were lost their jobs, people were struggling to get food, all these things, um, it became this tension about what our priorities are, right? Um, and some of that, and I and it got me really questioning, like, 
if we had an analysis of racial capitalism in our movements, how would that determine how we decided to deal with those resources? Right, like how would that shift how we might be able to do something? Um, and so that has just got me curious about like, that's also part of the curiosity about like, how are people learning about abolition? What are the things people being told about abolition? What it is and what it isn't, right? And like, as I said, the answer is still no, we don't want cops, that's very clear. And how do we nuance the ways in which um, we're asking those questions and thinking about community safety? In my own background, I came from like a healing justice background and thinking about what are the kind of like uh, the 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 backstage people <laughs> of movement, right? Who are making sure that people are fed, making sure that people are getting medicine, making sure that people are um, getting care for their kids, things like that, right? How are people making sure that we're centering our healing in all of this? Um, and I think that... Um, we need to continue to center those things um, because I think that's what helps us realize that our relationships are our biggest currency, right? That's the thing that's gonna help us survive. And the last point I'll say about that is I'm thinking about Ruthie Gilmore um, and she said that racial capitalism along with the prison industrial complex are technologies of anti-relationality, right? They are teaching us constantly to uh, prioritize individualism in service of capitalist accumulation, right? And so if we are thinking about if the prison is a, techn a technology of anti-relationality, how do we use indigenous ways of knowing, black ways of knowing, relational based ways of knowing to create spaces and build relationships where the priority are our relationships, right? Rather than the priority is, you know, especially in the academy, it's like, oh, we're, we're encouraged not to collaborate, but if we do, it's always for an output. It's always for a work, like, let's do this paper together. Let's do this panel, right? As opposed to like, how do we actually spend time building relationships and seeing what our relationships bring to fruition, right? And that could be collaboration, but that could just be friendship, kinship. Um, and I know that as a Black trans person, I always want to be in kinship with other Black trans people, right? And being, you know, I'm in a new country and I basically am like, how do I find my people, right? Like that is huge. And I think um, that has been um, a pillar in my abolitionist work that I think um, is like the not so fun stuff because like relationship takes work, right? Relationship takes, um, you know, some of my backgrounds also doing community accountability work. And now like, you know, 10 years ago, I was like, yes. And now I'm like, the way that people talk about accountability is like devoid of relationship. Like I'm gonna hold, we're gonna hold you accountable. We're gonna hold this institution accountable. And that's not how that works. <laughs> you know, like the uh, accountability requires relationship, right? It requires that you're in relationship with people. And the, the thing is, is when Coughlin comes, it gets messy and you have to figure out how to lean on your relationship to get through that. And that's a skill set that we don't always have. And so if we're not building this on a very ground level of how to be in relationship to each other, how to share resources in this way, how are we going to take down these bigger structures if we're not able to like get our needs met down here? So I do think that um, this idea of like leveraging our power to center relationships, I think is, um, has to be at the root of all our work, no matter what direction it takes. Um, I just dropped in the chat for folks, um, a Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective. They do pretty amazing work um, and they've got a whole list of resources. So just to sort of play off of or to add to this, right? Um, talking about accountability, talking about justice, talking about relationships. Um, folks are, are doing that work and they've compiled stuff. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel right? It doesn't have to be starting from scratch. How do I think about relationality? It can be doing things like doing a pod mapping exercise. Like who are the people I'm accountable to? And who is it, who is accountable to me, right? Um, just as a, a sort of practical resource guide for folks. And thank you for mentioning that because one of the other things that um, came up in that panel, that reproductive rights panel was thinking about now as um, you know, trans rights particularly are being gutted in all these places. How do we use this model of like 
pods to think about how to keep each other safe. I know that I leaned on the pod situation to get through COVID, right? Like, who am I, you know, thank God for being like a queer who's done poly for a long time, because I was like, great, we're doing negotiations, we're figuring out who's the pods, right? Like, I'm comfortable having these conversations where I, you know, in community, you know, in extended community with people who really were struggling because just they didn't know how to have a collectively kind of like minded approach to getting through this really hard time, right? And so we can think about what are their pods to get through COVID. We're gonna have another surge. There's like four respiratory things happening at the same time, right? But also like as our rights are getting gutted and things and it becomes more precarious in our in our everyday lives, how do we create these pods to figure out how to get our needs met, how to make sure we're getting food, getting meds, things like that. So there's I think sometimes people take these tools and they're like, we have to use them exactly how they were created. And it's like, no, like part of that is adapting. Like that pod, you know, situation is an adaptation of other things. So how do we adapt it to kind of fit our needs? And SA, if you want to go, I just, I, I just wanted to sort of add that um, one of the other things I think both with the Academy and beyond is about skill building um so also transferring skills that are kept in reserve that are hoarded in the university and really talking about empowering community members to use those skills on their own um autonomously is i think really important so for example some of the work that i've done around the 1033 program that's like foia freedom of information act requests um it was cipra the california uh uh, Public Records Act, right? Um, in North Carolina, it's the North Carolina Public Records Law. Um, letting people know how to make those requests so that they can actually engage in knowing what's going on in their city, in their community, because a big part of how a lot of, say, police violence and other forms of violence operate is by staying um being obfuscated by bureaucratic hurdles, right? Bureaucratic hurdles that the academy aids in and that also we have tools to navigate. So what does it look like to aid in skill building? And, and not just skill building in the university, but doing things like pods, right? That is also skill building. So it's, it is both, yes, about relationships and, and relationality, but again, if we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we can modify it, right? And so I also want to emphasize in our conversation today that we're not, this isn't necessarily just abstract things about sort of trans abolition. Trans abolitionists have built the, the boring bones of things like a pod mapping sheet, right? Or... Right, and those are things that people uh, can can utilize in order to build skills. Yeah, I don't want to. I uh, won't be too long, but um, Boo's last comments made me think about the name of the panel, um, where trans activism and abolition meet. And just <laughs> in case you didn't needed an answer, it's like right in the middle, right? But um, I. We didn't really get to talk about it so much, but I wanted to sort of tease out the thread too, um, that even though, you know, even if like all trans people um, uh, may not name ourselves like abolitionists, at the core of trans embodiment and identity is the abolition of something, right? And that would be namely gender, even if, I mean, I don't want, <laughs> we're towards the end of this, so I don't want to like, toss in my hot takes on the ridiculous discourses around like binary versus non-binary trans people. But um, thinking about, uh, you know, an abolition of gender as we know it, let's say it this way, so that even if we're attached to certain iterations of gender identification, transness necessarily dictates that um, relationship between an end to uh, the structure of gender, which is also the state, which is also coloniality, um, as we know it. So when we're thinking about um, ourselves, <laughs> our bodies ourselves, um, too soon, um, it's really, I think, useful to sort of articulate um, 
ourselves in in relation to the bigger picture and I'm I'm stammering because I don't want to like pull back because blue is very useful in like teaching us you know it's not to be so abstract but it is about like getting in where you fit in and even if that's on like the quote-unquote ground floor right and so um you know when Key was also talking about we've been talking about um uh, not knowing how to do community work I think it's really useful to you know figure out where it is that you are in the moment, right? Like when you think about how do we get rid of police and you don't know your neighbor to the left or to the right, maybe one way to start getting rid of police is knocking on our door. Um, if it doesn't feel, I mean, I'm saying this also as someone who is new to a new country again, um, and that is something that, uh, and I'm just vaguely asocial. So I'm like, that's awkward, but I also know in the big picture, it's gonna be useful. So let me just, you see my face, I see your face. Let's know at least who's just to your left and to your right. We can start here and we can sort of work our way out. Um, and that can be metaphorical, maybe if not in your building across the street or in, you know, where you work or if you have Trader Joe's, which I miss, you know, like wherever it is that you are um, to sort of figure out how to make those connections. I also wanted to, I, and I, I'm just really mindful of time, but I also want to sort of um, get us to think about um coloniality too is not something that is super abstract because it is something that permeates our lived ex experiences all the time it's not just think we've talked about it so this is just like really circling back to put a fine point on it when we're talking about U.S. imperialism settler colonialism and the broader sort of colonial forces that for me is what is resonating most when Key is talking about um, like the anti-relationality of racial capitalism and so I think it is um like really imperative that we think about that in relation to our skill sets, because it is, um, and this is a dual hour, our, those of us who teach and work in relation to the academy, sort of dole those things out, but also to acknowledge that people have skills, right? Something as banal as that. There are things that I learn specifically outside of the academy that keeps me able to live and struggle within and against it. Um, and I think it would be really useful for us to sort of figure out um, what those things are. So maybe I'm not the one who is um, upfront doing um, extroversion work as I'm not extroverted to like be out there and be like, can you I don't know, join or do talk to me, make eye contact, like weird stuff like that. But I will hold your baby, right? I love to cook. I like know my role, right? Like I know what it is that I can do and what I can offer to broader movements, right? I speak languages. Can I translate? Can I communicate? Can I get your abuela on the phone and like bring her around because she can make arepas for us? Like what is it that um, we can offer to not just the movement, TM, right, but one another precisely. Um, and thinking about transness, I think, is precisely the road to doing that. Even if, you know, uh, there are, I don't know, for the for the three people who may not be trans on the call, right, like, uh, it's really important to the, think of the interstitial relationship of trans identity, to think about um, already what that work does to unsettle and sort of like dwell in that unsettlement, right? Because it also um, itself is, I think, a pedagogical tool, right? Transness, just to like bring us back to that place. Transness and its unsettled relationship to gender, to race, to all of the things that we've been talking about. Some of us, again, dwell in that space, right? Negotiate that space, find relation, find love, find joy in that space, resist in that space. And I think rather than that additive model that Blue was talking about, about intersectionality, such that like white trans people are trans and not white somehow, we can actually think about the unsettled relationship of these interstitial identity points and figure out how or whether we want to sort of collectively dive in to that trouble as opposed to um, sort of being unilaterally or individually comfortable. Thank you all so much. We are a little bit over time, unfortunately, because of scheduling conflicts. We only had an hour to do this, although this conversation, I feel like could go on for another two or even three hours, but um, I don't want to hold people um, longer than the schedule. Um, do do you all want to share like maybe in the chat if um you're open to having people contact you or um please don't feel obligated to give out any contact info but um uh unfortunately we did not have the the time just because 
all of your points were just so good and needed to be said. Um, we unfortunately were not able to get to some of these audience questions, but um, thank you all again for joining us. And um, yes, while Twitter still lasts, um, I'm waiting for Twitter to go down any day now. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And I hope we can find a way to keep this conversation going after this call, as you were saying, like just having like one output as like collaboration is not the move. So um, hopefully we can figure out some way to keep this going. But for now, um, I don't want to hold people and I'm so thankful that you all were able to join us today. Thank you so much, Eri. Thank you, Blue and Key. I appreciate you all. This was just as generative and like heart filling as I expected. Thank you all so much for, for holding the space. Thanks so much for the invitation and grateful to be in community with you all. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 Oh, we're <laughs>